We arrived in Kigoma on December 2, 1926, and on the same day, we boarded a small ship which brought us across Lake Tanganyika to the town of Albertville, our first leg in the Belgian Congo. What a surprise to meet Benno there, one of my childhood friends. We were so happy to be together that he put the two of us up in his tiny hut-like abode for several days. At least we had what resembled a bed, a real mattress with proper sheets and pillowcases, and we ate fresh vegetables, grilled chicken, and tropical fruits such as mangoes, pomegranates, avocados, and papaya, which we had never tasted before and yet relished the last morsel. At first I found mangoes to be somewhat bland, though they were quite juicy. The papaya we ate with a zest of lemon. Contrary to the European habit of having avocados as an appetizer, we ate them as a dessert, with a sprinkle of cane sugar. Then there were the small but oh-so-sweet bananas, locally called lang de chat, cat's tongue. What a luxury, since back home only the very rich could afford some of these exotic fruits. To us boys, coming from the impoverished island of Rhodes, where, this must be stressed, we never lack good homemade food, with fresh vegetables and seasoned fruit, actually, I longed for my mother's delicious Jewish-Turkish dishes. It all seemed as if we were living a fairy tale, full of new sounds and potent smells. Some of them were terrifying, especially at night. We even asked our host if a lion or some hungry crocodile might come and eat us while we were asleep. He laughed his head off, yet kept us wondering. And how delighted we were the next morning at Cox Crow, seeing that we were still alive and in relatively good health although both of us had lost a lot of weight, for during the long boat trip from Port Said to Der es Salaam and the train journey that brought us to the village preceding Kigoma, where the Greek hotelier agreed to take us on for a few days, we subsisted on canned food, dried dates, and stale bread. Benno accompanied us to the station in Albertville, and we boarded a train for Caballo, which had only wooden planks for seats. Steam locomotives in those days were extremely slow and often broke down, but we did arrive the following day at Caballo, where we embarked on to the Prince Leopold, where we embarked onto the Prince Leopold, which sailed us down the Lualaba River. This too was a unique experience that lasted a little less than a week. The boat had to stop quite often for refueling. Its boilers functioned with wood coal which allowed our captain and other amateur hunters to use their skills and bring us back some game. This is how I got my first taste of antelope, wild pheasant, and warthog meat. The boat also served as a floating market for the villagers ashore. Hardware and clothes were sold in exchange for fresh fish, fowl, vegetables, and fruit. More than once did the boat get stuck because of large banks of papyrus. Hours of work and dozens of African hands were needed to remove them. That river crossing remains one of the most spectacular adventures I experienced in the heartland of the Congo. Bukama was the terminal point. My new boss, Mr. Robert Toledano, came to receive me on the quay. We barely got acquainted, and two hours later, I jumped on the train headed for Kamina in northern Katanga, which was to be my final destination. Kamina was at the crossroad between the Lower Congo and Katanga's copper mines. There I met my boss's other two partners and the fifty-odd workers and employees of the firm. Appointed shop assistant at the grocery store, I started working the very same afternoon of my arrival. There were seven of us at that branch store. Late in the evening, around the dinner table, I got acquainted with my fellow employees and the different activities our company dealt in. I thus learned that it owned two bakeries one for Europeans, and one for Africans who, by the hundreds, passed through the area hailing from as far away as Kusai province, en route to and from the famous copper mines of the Union Minère du Haut Katanga. There also was a butcher, for the region had rich pastures with cattle breeding and stock farms, a bar, and a general retail store. With the bar, the simple brick dwellings huddled around the station and our work barracks, in which I would spend most of my time. You'd have done the round of our town, it was more of a hamlet, really. In our stockroom could be found all the staples and the necessary products for our livelihood, such as rice, flour, canned food, wax material, also known as java prints, sporting vivid colors with flowery as well as geometric designs, a feast for the eyes that were imported from Manchester in England or from Holland. 
These fabrics were very popular with the Congolese women who would sew bright katang, loincloths. They also acquired staple foods from us, glass beads to make collars and bracelets, as well as all sorts of hardware and tools for cooking, washing, and growing vegetables. You could also find fishing hooks, screwdrivers, hammers, safety pins, gas stoves, and hurricane lamps. Three days after my arrival, I felt ill with high temperature. I must have contracted malaria during the boat and train trips. I had to be confined to my room, if you can call a room a barrack made of mud walls held by bamboo rods. The sheets of my iron bed were constantly wet since the rain leaked through the roof. One of my fellow employees came to my rescue and installed a metal basin on top of the bed with four wooden pillars and a blanket to absorb the excess water. Of course, the basin had to be emptied several times during the day after the storms, which along the equator can be terrifying as well as ear-splitting. After every one of these earth-shattering thunderclaps, I was dead scared that the lightning might fall over my abode and burn it down. At night, I had to take care of everything myself so as not to disturb the other employees. Finally, after two days and two nights during which I was in a state of near delirium tremens, a bush doctor was called in, who gave me quinine injections at regular intervals. That is how I was saved from certain death, for many people in those days succumbed to that very debilitating sickness. In less than 48 hours after the doctor's last visit, I could resume work. There wasn't such a thing as fixed working hours. All depended on present circumstances and on the requirements of our clients. Most of them were transit passengers, and very often I had to attend to them at the bar up to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and the following day. I had to get up as early as 5 a.m., delivering loaves of warm-baked bread to the numerous natives working in the mines. The train drove through Kamina twice a week, and one of our duties was to supply the dining coach with fresh food. Since there existed no restaurant or hotel as such in our tiny outpost, we were asked to accommodate and serve hot meals in our shabby premises to any stranger, traveling salesman, or manager who passed by, whether they belonged to our company or not. The store itself was built with corrugated iron, which made for quasi-untenable heat during the day, becoming drastically cold at night. Because our customers could appear at any odd time of the day or night, they may be stuck in the bush if they happened to drive a car that broke down because of the flooded road paths, I decided to sleep in a corner of the store on a bare mattress which I found tucked away in the storage room. But after two weeks of that regimen, I became weak and sick. Happily, my plea was heeded, and I was offered a small mud wall hut all to myself, where the differences of temperature were more bearable. I was only 17 and had many responsibilities on my shoulders. Apart from the various jobs I held in Kamina itself, I was instructed to go and visit the firm's 20 subsidiary stores which were scattered all over the bush and in the surrounding villages. These stores were managed by trained Congolese shop assistants. My task consisted of supplying them regularly with a Ford company truck, checking accounts, and taking stock of the goods at the end of each month. These were days of 16 to 18 hours work. 363 days a year, with the exception of Christmas and New Year's Day. I didn't know what the words rest or vacation meant, and this went on for eight solid years, until I got so thin and emaciated, I now weighed less than 50 kilos and was 5 foot 9. I even fainted a couple of times, to the point that Mr. Toledano, who had been informed of my state, strongly reprimanded my chief of staff. The poor guy, he kept warning me not to overdo it, but I wouldn't listen to him believing I had the energy to go on without any rest. My boss insisted that I stop working and suggested that I recuperate for a couple of months at a seaside resort in the then Union of South Africa, for the trip to Europe was much too expensive for me and my main preoccupation rested with my family back in Rhodes, to whom I used to send the greater part of my allowance money, which didn't represent much of course since I earned about 1,500 Congolese francs every month, the equivalent of 30 US dollars. Thus it was that I spent the very first vacation of my life in Seaport Cape Town, on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, which is the southernmost tip of the Black Continent. These were the most invigorating and thrilling weeks I had ever spent. Yet, whenever I thought of my family back in Rhodes, I got a lump in my throat. But I would be lying if I said that I regretted these three weeks, lounging on Cape Town's magnificent beaches every morning. The sand was so white and glaring, you couldn't look at it lest you burned your irises. 
and how I indulged in the local food, like those succulent mutton chops or the grilled local bass accompanied with roast potatoes and crunchy raw vegetables. But the crown of Cape cuisine was a fabulous array of shellfish, both a novelty and a luxury to me, for I had never had the opportunity of tasting such delicacies before. This is how I discovered the art of dismembering crabs and lobsters to extract their soft, buttery flesh. Then, with a Belgian acquaintance who shared my room at the pension there, we decided to rent a Mini Morris and drive through the entire garden route, which resembled a huge patchwork of Van Gogh, Matisse, and Monet paintings combined. So vivid was the explosion of colors unfurling before our eyes. With such a regimen, I came back having gained 10 kilos and became so tanned, people in South Africa often mistook me for an Indian. This is where I felt the humiliation and the indignity that racial segregation inflicts upon peoples of color. Institutionalized apartheid came later on, but this was bad enough. I even got arrested once by the police as I was entering a store. I had to show them my passport to prove I was an Italian citizen but this gave me a bad taste and made me feel ill at ease from then on. Thank goodness it only happened towards the end of my stay, for otherwise I would have certainly wanted to shorten my vacation. No one can accept such inhumane treatment. <laughs> <laughs>